Good morning, everybody. My name is Isabel Cullen. I am a member of the Smear Lab here at the University of Oregon in the Institute of Neuroscience. And today I'll be talking to you about my thesis project called Active Olfactor Motor Responses in Head Fixed Mice. So our lab studies the olfactory system, so essentially your sense of smell. So we're combining this with my interest um, in autism spectrum disorder. So autism spectrum disorder is a neurodevelopmental condition characterized by deficits in communication, uh, communication and social skills, repetitive behaviors, and narrowed interest. So I'm sure you're curious, what does this have to do with olfaction? So a couple years ago, there was a study um, conducted looking at typically developing children and children with autism and their responses to attractive and aversive odorants. So normally when you smell something attractive, you actually take in a larger volume of it. So you can kind of see that demonstrated in figure 1A. So you take in a larger volume of the pleasant odor and a smaller volume of the unpleasant odor. So in the study, they did find that typically developing children um, perform similarly to previous research. However, children with autism did not. They did smell um, pleasant odors similarly to the typically developing children, but smelled the unpleasant odors about the same. So, but the thing is, they could still tell you this is pleasant, this is not pleasant. So that leads you to question, what is the neural mechanism that is causing the change in this olfactor motor behavior? So my goal of our project is to understand the neural mechanism underlying this altered sniff behavior observed in children with autism. So we're doing this by studying, um, studying and repeating this in mice. So mice actually have a really strong olfactory system. They have a lot of more genes that code for um, different olfactory neurons in their system. So previous research in our lab has looked at olfactory navigation, so essentially how you locate things with your sense of smell. And they actually can do this with pretty accurately. Um, but in this particular graph in figure two, we're actually looking at how much they move their nose side to side and up and down. Um, and we can see in the bottom part of uh, figure two in both A and B, that the speed that they move their nose side to side and up and down is actually really high when they're actually engaged in an olfactory task. Whereas when they're not engaged in a task in this inner trial interval, their uh, nose speed actually doesn't really change very much. So this gives us a really good proxy and like a really good system to look at the olfactory system. Um, but also combine this with genetic models of autism. Um, so there have been about 150 um, genes linked to autism, but none as a definitive cause. But there are instances where, where you knock certain genes out, um, they can actually induce autism-like symptoms in the mouse. So for our purposes, we'll be using the contactin-associated protein like two um, mice, so CNTNAP mice, as I'll commonly refer to them to. Um, these mice actually have decreased vocalizations, um, decreased socializations with other mice, and then also engage in a lot of repetitive behaviors, so like increased grooming. Um, so with this, we're, you know, like I said, we're repeating the same study um, in mice. So how we do this is we implant the mouse with a device called a thermistor, which allows us to um, monitor their breathing, and then we expose them to different odorants. So our aversive odorant is something called methyl butyric acid. Um, our attractive odorant will be 2-phenylethanol, which is a component of roses. Um, a neutral odorant will be pinene, um, which is something we've used in previous experiments. And then clean air is our control. So in the, the task, they're um, exposed to 20 blank trials just to kind of get them used to it. Um, and then the remaining 80 trials within the session are randomized between these four odors. So what we found so far is actually really interesting. Um, in figure 5a, we actually compared um, the volume of odor that they take in with um, on first inhalation after exposure, which is similar to the hypothesis of the um, original autism paper that I presented. So what we found is they actually don't really differ that much in terms of volume um, taken in upon first inhalation. So obviously it's a little bit different um, from the original uh, paper, but there's also a caveat in that mice actually smell a lot faster than humans do. Um, so in that case, we actually decided to look at how many sniffs per second they do take upon first inhalation. Um, so we move to figure 5B. So in this, we actually see that 2-phenylethanol is actually um, 
it breathed in at a way higher rate than uh, 2MB acid, which is our aversive odorant. So that gives us a good idea of like, okay, we're maybe heading in the right direction. Maybe there is this same effect in, um, in mice that we see in typically developing children. And we're also um, trying to analyze the olfact, like oral facial movements um, of the mice in response to aversive and attractive odors. Um, so we do this by um, looking at video footage from the side and from the bottom to track um, lateral and vertical um, positioning of the nose in response to odors. So we'll also be doing this um, in part with this same experiment and we're hoping to look to see if there are potentially neural correlates related to different facial, um, facial movements that mice have actually been shown to make in response to certain types of odorants. Um, so hopefully in the future we hope to take this same project and apply it to CNT nap mice, um, but also be able to do it um, in freely moving mice. So what that means is normally in a lot of science experiments, you actually head fix them out. So they're just in a neutral position. They can't really move. They're not moving naturalistically. So by allowing them to be freely moving, they're acting more as they would in the wild. So when we do this, um, Preliminary data from our lab has shown that they actually cells have very different responses to being head fixed um, versus freely moving. So you can kind of see that um, in figure 8B, what you're seeing is the, the firing rate of the cell while it's head fixed, while it's, and then while it's freely moving, you can see a major difference in terms of like the temporal patterns um, when it's head fixed versus not. So this is really interesting and we're hoping to continue to develop this um, as we go along throughout the summer and through the remaining um, time at Oregon for me um, and with my thesis. So with that, I'd really like to um, thank my lab and all of their help, um, Dorian, Jared, Avinash, Reese, um, and just everybody that contributed to this project as I've not been able to be there during the pandemic, um, but really helping to set up the foundation for this project and also my PI for all of his mentorship um, throughout the year and just throughout my time in Oregon, I truly appreciate it. Um, but also want to thank the Peter O'Day Fellowship and the UROC Mini Grant um, for funding this uh, project over the summer of 2020.